Hi, today I'm joined with John Byrne, who's very kindly agreed to chat to us about his diverse and wide ranging career so far. John, thanks so much for getting in touch. No, thanks very much, Ronan. I appreciate the invitation to, to come on and um, it was great to meet you at the Web Summit before and, and, you know, strike up the relationship there. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, exactly. So we we connected on, at the Web Summit where you were pitching one of your businesses. But before we go into that, could you tell us, uh, from your perspective, what do you do? Uh, well, at, at the moment, I'm co-founder of two different startups, um, both radically different. One's called Riders Block. Oh, other way. That side, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this way. And uh, the other one is called Right Pay. Um, and I manage the commercial side of both businesses, um, which is largely sales, marketing, and finance, and the kind of go to market stuff there. Um, so, kind of anything that relates to the commercial side of, of either business. Okay. So, does that mean that you've got like developers and project, product managers or product owners working with you? Or are you trying to do all of those things? Oh, I do all of those things. Yeah, yeah. I, I am the, the project manager. So, for example, with Right Pay, one of my co- my co founder, my only co founder, is the developer himself. Um, so he looks after the tech side there. So that's quite handy. Um, for Writer's Block, my co founder is a journalist. So he, you know, I have no major experience or, or connection to the the world of journalism or media or publishing. And um, what he does, and that's that's his area of expertise. Um, so it's funny because they, you know, we have two different business strategies for growing both companies, right? With right pay, because we have a technical co-founder, we can build something quickly and get it into people's hands and get them using it and try and, you know, and then, you know, figure out what's, what's working and what's not, uh, through that approach with writer's block, it's a little bit more different. We have to do everything manually and then build a cake in order to go out and then sort of effectively get funding to build a technical version or a technology that will do what we're doing manually. Okay, so you're reverse engineering it? Is that what you mean? Like you're building, are they building the product manually and then you're trying to get funding? Yeah, and so then we're, get we're people... basically doing everything manually. So, okay. so basically, I'll just give you a rundown. It makes it easier yeah. than sort of t- t- talking in the abstract. So Writer's Flock, um, is a, essentially it's two-sided, right? We cater for journalists and writers and then also to publishers. So if, um, so it's an agency for journalists and writers. Um, so we find them commercial opportunities. We find them writing opportunities. We train them. We help them improve their skills, uh, not just in terms of the writing, but also in terms of, you know, being a freelancer, um, and being independent. And then on top of that, we also, um, for publishers, then if they have a particular, you know, story that they want to cover or area or topic or region even, um, that they need somebody on the ground or they need coverage for. We provide that then and we'll provide them either with one particular journalist who fits the bill or a selection that they can choose from then that, that suits their their audience preference. Um, so within that, like, we do a lot of that matching, so to speak, manually. Um, so what we're trying to do then is do it enough manually so we can figure out the kinks and figure out what works and what doesn't um, and then use that to build uh, a case to get some funding to build a, 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 to build a platform, a tech platform that will do that. Now we've done the first part of that. So we have our MVP. Uh, it's very basic at the moment, but as I said, we're, excuse me, we're gearing up to, to build that out and to keep, um, you, you know, to keep essentially adding some of the value that we, that we bring manually to, to journalists and then being able to, to put that on the platform so that they can derive that themselves. Uh, through the platform so that we don't have to do it. They don't have to interact with us. And then we can obviously then scale that out so that we can impact and help a lot more people that they're not relying on us as individuals that they can just use the, the platform. What's the, what are some of the challenges in terms of making that manual process more uh, automated? <laughs> have to long bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, get... Where do you start? <laughs> yeah. Um, interesting. Okay, so one of the biggest challenges is um, I guess trying to find out where the value really lies with people, because that's what you have to build into the, to the platform, to the technology, right? So what do people actually want out of what you're providing or what you're doing for them? And t- 
typically anyway, with most startups, you have a hypothesis, you have an idea in your mind, but you have to go out and validate that, right? So you go out and talk to people, you go out and ask them a bunch of questions and, you, and then you figure out and you ask them about their career and what they're doing and how they go about their work. And that flow, you know, that follows for both journalists and for publishers. So you can, um, so, so that's actually tricky because people often tell you what they want you to hear or what they think you want to hear. So there's a bit of a, there's a bit of an, an art to teasing out what the actual problem underneath. Um, so for example, if you, you know, any publisher will tell you they want more premium content, they want more content and better content, right? That's very easy to say, but then what do they mean by that then at the end of the day? Really what they're trying to do is find the right content for their audience that will help them increase their subscriptions, their paid subscriptions, increase their paywall clicks, increase their, um, you know, their paid membership, whatever they call it, right? But basically, and then, you know, some of them don't even know then whether or not, oh, should we be going after those, that type of revenue, subscription revenue, or should we be going after, you know, advertising revenue, right? And they're very different models because the advertising revenue is very much, that model is very much based on volume. So there's a great article actually by um, a crowd called The Audiencers. And um, they have a really nice article about, you know, comparing the difference between sort of, you know, one paid subscriber versus 48,000 impressions, right? And that's the kind of premise of the article. So, um, and that's what publishers are facing today, right? right? And given the advent of, of all the, you know, new GPTs and new um, sort of generative text tools and all this sort of stuff, that, that creates a massive a headache, right? Because you're thinking, well, you know, do we produce so much quantity now, but massively reduce the quality, but then, you know, we can just pump out so much more or do we scale back and focus only on quality, but then we reduce the quantity a lot more. And then, you know, so either poses its own challenges, um, but that's up to the publishers to decide where they actually want, which side of the line they want to. Wow. So you're acting as a business consultant nearly as the very first step when you're speaking to publishers and saying, what is your revenue model and your monetization strategy? In some ways, yeah. Now we try and avoid, like if, if somebody says to us, like, well, we're, we're focused on ad revenue, then that will probably push us out the door because, you know, a lot of those articles are the short form, clickbaity. Um, I, I mean, not always, but oftentimes then if you're looking at a newspaper, for example, or even a digital newspaper, it'll be, the headline, the daily update, the, you know, the, the, the minuscule changes in the story that keep happening every few minutes or whatever. So, and, and, you know, it might only be a four or 500 word article if it's a, if it's on a, like a, a digital publication or whatever, or even a, an in-print publication. So we don't really focus on that sort of stuff at all as a, you know, from, from our written content point of view, we focus more on premium niche content. So a thousand to 3000 words, very in-depth, long form read, um, and, and features and analysis and interviews and all that sort of stuff, which that sort of stuff is more bottom of the funnel for publishers. So that's very much geared towards their, um, you know, th that's what their paid subscribers are there to read. Wow. Okay. So. It sounds like uh, that's quite a heavy piece of work trying to match the publishers with that bottom of the funnel contact, content. What's the response from them so far? Um, I mean, that's like asking how long is a piece of string in some ways. Yeah. You know, it depends on the publisher, right? Right. Um, without naming any one, like we're based, our um, headquarters is in Ireland, right? I'm in, I'm in France, but our headquarters is in Ireland. And most Irish publications kind of laughed at the door. Um, but they have their own interesting challenges and problems, won't name any names, um, but they, they very much rejected what we were doing. Having said that, there's like, we're global now, like we're, we've got publications in the Middle East, in Asia, in the UK, in the state. That's so, um, you know, it really depends. So, so essentially a lot of publications now are faced with the question of, well, it's not a question really. It's, you have to embrace the digital revolution that's happening, right? Um, and a lot of them have been very slow to do that over the last 20 to 30 years with, you know, the advent of the internet, social media, they, they've missed the boat on both of those. So now you've got this interesting dynamic for them where a lot of them, they're trying to not miss the boat with AI. So, you know, 
this is why there's been such a sort of popular jump toward, you know, the idea that journalism is dead and these generative models are going to just write everything. And, and that's not actually true because if you read a lot of the articles, now, admittedly, they're getting better, but still, if you read a lot of the articles, yeah, they're, they're just kind of clickbaity. There's not a huge amount of depth or color or flavor. And um, the savvy publications are recognizing that, like, we can implement this from a productivity standpoint to either help our news team or, um, you know, you can do various different things with, with it in terms of productivity instead of being a generative um, tool, right? They're not trying to use it to create content. They're trying to use it to improve operations. Whereas you've got others who d- don't engage at all. They're like, no, no, we're not going near any of that. We don't like digital. We don't like this. And they're the people that are going to fall by the wayside. But at the same time, don't like I know the digital revolution is uh, posing all those challenges for the industry. But at the same time, I feel we're reading more than ever because we're on our phones so much, because we're on our computers so much. I feel I would read much more articles now than if I just mm. bought the newspaper once a day or once a week. Or, because, you know, you're reading blogs, you're reading articles, you're reading uh linkedin pieces um so i feel we're reading much more i feel there's more opportunity not less people people say like oh people don't read anymore what reading more than ever come on (laughs) yeah exactly yeah it's just a different form of reading right um so like physical print in physical print's a funny one right and newspapers are physically you know are physically the physical print of newspapers, that those sales are in decline, right? And that's probably going to be a bit of a novelty in future. However, if you look at magazines, especially the savvy ones, they have sweet, they've embraced this quality over quantity model, right? So if you look at, I think it's Cars Worlds, just to take a random example, they used to produce, I think, once a month for all, you know, whatever it was. And it was like a 20 euro magazine, something like that, um, 20 pounds in the UK. And they would produce once a month. And they noticed that their readership was slightly, ever so slightly, slowly going into decline. Well, and then a lot of their stuff was quantity based over quality based. They were just trying to push out more and more content more often. They completely revamped the model. They now only do four issues a year. So once a quarter, they uh, increased their price something like by two and a half or three times to what it was. So it's now over 50, I think it's 50 euros now, or maybe $50. Anyway, it's, it's not 20. Anyway, it's, it's at least double, if not more. And their subscribership and their readers jumped massively. After having a couple of years in decline, they changed just the way they approached their, they deliver their content and the content itself. And that had a massive impact. And there's loads of companies uh, and loads of publications that are in the same boat. I mean, I think this is funny. One of the most savvy and um, like, you know, to use a cool kid's phrase with us, you know, yeah. uh, uh, magazine that's out there is Gardner's World. You wouldn't think that, but Gardner's World are incredibly smart in the way that they're run and in the way they're approaching um, both how, like what the content they're producing, how they're producing it, and then also how they, um, you know, use digital tools in the background. Because that's one thing that a lot of publishers are, are new to now, right? So we might think as just readers that, oh, um, you know, we, we've had digital in, in news for ages, you know, I get my stuff online and, and whatever. And that's about the extent of it, right? Actually in the back end, especially uh, in terms of, you know, the publications interacting with freelancers and trying to source content through freelancers outside of their existing newsroom um, and team of writers, that's pretty archaic. Like people are still relying on the phone and email and on their old existing network. And a lot of those networks since COVID have been decimated because publications went under, journalists left the industry, um, people, you know, did, did a whole range of reasons with, you know, you list them all by wealth. But so that completely upended all of these networks. And, you know, in the last couple of years, as we've seen, like I said, some publications have been very quick to say, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to adopt certain things and modernize the back end and modernize our operation. And others haven't recognized it and they're suffering for it. So what of Gardner's World? Though? Gardner's World, um, a lot. So they have embraced things like, you know, um, they've added like games and, and all sorts of stuff to some of their um, 
And first of all, they have a great digital, they, they still produce a physical magazine, but they also have a great digital presence where a lot of the stuff that's in the physical print is enhanced then online. They've added things like games and all these interactive type of tools and tricks and tips that, you know, um, that, that you can kind of use in your garden, for lack of a better phrase, or whatever you're doing for your planting or other things. So it's just, they've made it a lot more interactive and they've made mm-hmm. it, they've kind of gamified some of the stuff that they've done online. Um, and as I said, it enhanced all right. of the stuff that's in the physical print rather than... So they're adding tons tons of value online and, and maybe doing platform specific things that can't be done in print. So that, that makes total sense and it's good. Yeah. That, that's a nice innovative approach to it. Um, it's very interesting what you say about the, the higher level content or the premium contents. I heard a very good speaker uh, at the conference and he was talking about how like the AI generates all this content that's, that stays in the middle, right? So it's nice, it's gener- it gets the point across, but he was saying he doesn't necessarily want to produce or write anything that's, you know, it, like mediocre or that's in the middle that just gets a point across. He wants to write something that's exceptional, that really stands out, that that's memorable. Like, like this article you mentioned, uh, right? It's super memorable because it had such an effect on you and it really resonates and it makes a good point. And sometimes he appreciates that even though it might totally bomb, it's worth having something that bombs or something that really resonates rather than sort of milky, lukewarm uh, sort of stuff that doesn't go anywhere. And it also reminds me of an article I read similar, which was uh, A Thousand True Fans by a guy called Kevin Kelly. I'm sure you've come across that at some point, right? So it's this yeah. idea of having super fans that will that will pay you and that will respect the sort of work that you're doing. But it also means that you know you don't need to have the whole... You don't need to have like Justin Bieber, 10 million or 10 billion people or whatever to to have a business. And um, so it's just a different way of thinking about the the content. Do you yeah. see platform? Yeah, sorry. Well, just to, just to add to that or just to continue on, like exactly as you say, I mean, the super fans are the, are the fans that keep you going, right? I mean, whether it's music or sports or, or you know, even just for writing and people like, like, you know, the people that buy the merchandise, the people that show up to your speaking events, the people that buy, they're all the same people, right? The people that, that, that contribute to your Patreon, whatever it is, they're all the same people and they want to hear what you have to say. And uh, as long as you, in my opinion, anyway, as long as you focus on quality over quantity, um, you'll keep them happy. And then that will, and, it, and if you can grow that organically then, rather than trying to, you know, force a massive audience that's only semi-engaged like it's better to have 100 percent engagement with a thousand people than you know five percent engagement with you know ten thousand people or whatever yeah i totally agree it does i totally agree with you um i think it contradicts a lot of the social media strategies which is like oh let's get you a million followers or let's get you two million followers it's like but if they're just grazers or people just passing by or window shopping then they're not going to be the proper people. And then you're getting feedback from an audience that doesn't actually appreciate what you're doing um, because they're only window shopping. Can I ask you, what does a day in the life look like of a co-founder of two uh, two startups? Uh, you know, someone listening to you, they're like, oh, you're, yeah, disorganized. It's kind of like, how do you wrap your head around it? It's like, we know you're, you're running these two businesses, one's for... Uh, the marketplace for the writers and the the journalists and the other one is the payment system but like mm-hmm. how, what do you do how, like how does that day look like yeah um i try and split my time as best i can but you know honestly i'm i'm really bad at it um i'm very disorganized um it's something i'm really trying to, trying to work on <laughs> um but i usually what I, i'm like so for example one of the things that i'll do is i'll, I'll carve out hours specifically for write pay I'm like all right first usually actually first maybe two hours a day or for right pay. Um, cause that, as I said, we when like my co-founder is a technical co- co-founder. So we have a product that we can put in people's hands. So certain things that I don't necessarily need to do. So I'll check in first thing in the day, make sure that, you know, I'll do my outreach. I'll do my lead generation. I'll do whatever, a little bit of research and so maybe three hours start every day. That'll be right pay, maybe two hours. Um, and then I'll go focus on writer's block for the rest of the day because I think it's a little bit more messy and there's a little bit more kind of, um, you know, um, T's to be crossed and I's to be dotted there. Um, but, but it cut off this to, yeah, I don't, re- like, it's funny. The reason I even ended up doing two startups is completely by accident because, um, so just to give you a very 
quick version. Um, I I didn't lose my job, but I didn't get my contract renewed during COVID, right, from when I was working over here in France. And uh, I was working on an investment team and investments were no more during COVID because they didn't know what the hell was going to go on. So I went back and did a master's. After I did a master's, I, I couldn't get a job. So uh, I, I was bored and desperate. So I was asking everybody here, if you need help in anything, this is what I do. So, you know, and it just so happened a few people, a few different people came back to me and asked for, for help with certain things. And I was kind of just chipping in again, all for free, not really, I wasn't getting paid or anything like that. And then these two things happened to come across my radar. And, um, you know, the more I spoke to the guys on the, on for both of the projects and the more we sort of dug into them, sort of think like, oh, there's actually, there's a good business here. Um, we just maybe a couple of tweaks and change a couple of things, but yeah, there's a good business here. And we'll see what happens. And then, you know, fast forward two years, they both kind of kept evolving. I didn't want to step away from either of them. And, um, I'm actually fantastic up here. So you've obviously got some mad networking skills, uh, John, to be able to uh, create these two opportunities for yourself. So you're the kind of commercial partner in both of these. And then the, uh, your other partners are the technical guys or the industry specialists. Is that right? Um, yeah, well, my co-founder Scott, um, for right pay, I mean, I wouldn't call him a payment specialist, but he's a, he's a developing wig. Like he's an absolute genius. I mean, um, it's funny when he was 14, he built uh, a store. In, you know the game Minecraft? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, when he was 14, he built a shop in Minecraft selling things that couldn't be sold. Or no way. Right? And he was taken in something like eight grand a month, right? So the guy, <laughs> the guy, a genius in that wow. regard. Um, so he's great with tech on that sort of stuff. Um, Ewan is my other business partner for Riders Block. He is, uh, and neither of us actually are tech really at all, but he's a journalist. He's got a full career as a journalist, as an editor. He's written book. Um... Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's won awards for his writing and everything like that. So he understands that industry really, really well from that perspective. Um, but as I said, yeah, we're still looking for the, for the, the development side, the tech side on. on right. Uh, right. Do you feel you've entrepreneurial blood, um, uh, in the family or in your genes? Um, because I see in college, you actually had a, a venture as well, right? <laughs> yeah. I've had a couple of failed ventures during my time. Um, yeah, well, I guess my, my, but didn't you win an award for that? Uh, we came second. Right. Yeah, it's still pretty good. Uh, didn't win, though. <laughs> <laughs> should have won, should have won, but we didn't win. But anyway, <clears throat> um, no, it was great. Like, my, my dad started his own business um, when he was in his late 20s, early 30s. And, you know, that's been pretty successful. No, it took a while, but, it you know, um, it's been pretty successful over, over time. So it's been a good role model for me. My granddad on my mum's side he basically uh well he was in the army but when he retired he helped people in the local enterprise office like you know get their career together and sort themselves out and all that stuff and and he was always full of great advice as well so i've always kind of had a you know and also when i you know i'm not much of a I, you know i was always the kind of one to to get in trouble in school a little bit and you know i've always had a little bit of a problem with authority <laughs> respect <laughs> so it's a great reason to start a business or two so well just nobody nobody would keep me or hire me or you know what i mean i was always i was always uh, rocking the boat too much but, uh, <laughs> people don't like getting wet so uh right eventually get, you know eventually just slide and i'll do my own thing um but i've always tried stuff i mean yeah in college i did uh it was called clink the college link and um, basically it was to help students um who it basically helped them find a, a third level course, right? One of the things we found in our in our research when we were doing that um, was the number one and number two resources for Irish students when picking a university course was mum at number one and dad at number two. Wow. And uh, which is, to me is terrifying. Like, uh, you know, for example, right? If somebody was going to do an engineering course or thinking about an engineering course, you might think that, oh, I'll go and, Okay, one, you'll check out the perspective. Okay, that was source number three, by the way. They were the top three, mum, dad, and perspective. But the perspective is just advertising, right? It's like, it's trying to sell you the court. So it's not really, so you might think that after that, maybe if you're on the ball, you'll go and speak to an engineer who did the same course. Or you speak to somebody in the course currently, or you might speak to somebody who's done engineering, but in a different university or whatever else, right? Maybe speak to a few of these people and kind of compare and contrast. 
or speak to someone who's in the job and say, what's the job like? Do you like it? What do you? Yeah. What do you do? What do you like? What do you? What? Right. That's part of that's part of our podcast to help people figure out what people actually do day to day. Yeah. This is why I love your podcast, right? Because this is why it really resonated with me because uh, no one does that uh, or very, very few people do that. Now, maybe now um, with such easy access, uh, bear in mind, this was back in 2013 or 14, 14, right. I think. So, um, now obviously it was the internet and social media and all that sort of stuff, but obviously in the last 10 years, it's completely accelerated and developed and the access to information and all sorts of diverse information is much greater. So perhaps it's different. Um, I haven't been in that space in, in a long time, but at the time, um, you know, people would just go, Hey mom, what should I do? Oh, do this. Okay. And that was it. So yeah. we found that to be pretty outrageous. And so we tried to build a platform that would kind of help students um, pick courses that were suited to them. So the idea of being they could put in stuff that they like, first of all, the subjects they were good at school and then maybe their hobbies and the stuff that they like. And then that would kind of match up with um, courses that would obviously have, you know, all these criteria. And if the criteria match, then you get a suggestion, oh, maybe do this course or maybe consider this or this might be for you. And, uh, and that was kind of the basic idea of it. Yeah, fantastic. So um, trying to match them with their ideal course based on their interests and skills and so on. You know, uh, and, and then a few years later, another matching service crosses your path so we can see kind of where a uh, writer's block comes in there. <laughs> yeah. You love a good matching service, it seems. I do love a good matching service. If only the, the dating matching services work in my favor, that, uh, that's where I'm falling down. Well, there, there's a promotion for you as well, right? You might get a date out of this podcast too. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, you never know. Oh, that's fantastic. John's in Paris for anyone who's interested. Uh, <laughs> city of love. So there you go. It's it's interesting, but when you think about the uh, the people in college not uh, using their mom and dad, or let's say tapping into their mom and dad's knowledge or their advice to pick a course, it is it is kind of crazy. Sure, you can consult them, but they might. They're like it's interesting for me when I ask people where they get their ideas from. Often it's like whatever close proximity they have. So if someone says to me. Um, I really want to be a teacher. Uh, I'll say, are your parents teachers? And often they'll say, yeah, my parents are teachers. And it's like, yep. you know, if that's fine. So if you want to be a teacher, yeah, go go be a teacher. But it's also good to see what other options are because once you expand what your horizons are, you have a much better chance of seeing, oh, maybe that would be interesting for me as well. I just didn't know it existed, which is part of the reason, you know, talking to people like yourself and, and expanding people's horizons to see what they are, to, to find out what exists allows people to see all these different oh, i didn't know you could network and uh speak to people who are technical people and then work on two startups simultaneously i didn't know that was a thing and now they listen to you and they think oh maybe that is a thing but the other thing that i think is crazy is when if you think of someone uh who's interested in medicine and they think oh i'm fascinated by medicine i want to help people i'm going to be a doctor that sounds like a very reasonable set of things and I've got 600 uh, points in my uh, leave insert, which in Ireland is the top marks in your exam. All that makes sense. Yeah, go and be a doctor. But if you speak to people who are in healthcare, um, okay, some of them love it for sure and they're having a great time. And other people, they really struggle because the system around them, not the actual work, but the system around them can be difficult. So then it's, for, it's a real conflict. It's like, I love what I do, but I'm not having a good time at work. Yeah, there's a couple of industries like that. Healthcare, I mean... I could go down the rabbit hole, but I, I won't. I try not to. The healthcare system in Ireland isn't great. I mean, it's number one funded in the OECD, and the number it's the lag in terms of performance. Right, so equate that. Right, M- most amount of money per capita, worst performance. Go figure. Um, so uh, it's same for teachers. It's the same for nurses. It's the same. You know, so you might really like helping people. You might really like you know, imparting the knowledge onto, you know, you might want to help kids, you want to do whatever. Um, but it's just not financially rewarding enough for you to sustain a proper career. And that to me is, is sad, right? And the same with things like, you know, policing as well and things like that. People, you know, especially if you maybe grow up in a conservative household, you might really value law and order and all this kind of thing. But, you know, you try and become yeah. a policeman in Ireland, in the UK, in the US. I mean, those those positions aren't respected anymore. First of all, from the public, because there's been such, you know, so many different scandals and things like that. Um, 
And then on top of that, from the system, like you say, I mean, if they were respected, I mean, back in ancient Greece, right? If you wanted to be a law and order officer in any capacity, even if that was a policeman, you had to be extremely highly educated. You had to be mm. knowledgeable and you had to, you know, essentially prove that you could sort of think a step ahead and, and be a little bit more level-headed and measured than the average Joe, because that was required. Uh, now that's completely, I mean, obviously, you know, Seven years ago, I appreciate that, um, but but I don't know where that's gone. You know those types of roles which were revered. And now I think that maybe in future, it's not happening just yet, but I think in future that might come back around, um, yeah. where we do revere teachers and we do revere policemen and we do revere nurses and 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 doctors, um, because those guys work so incredibly hard for so little reward or recognition and everything. And like you say, you know, you might really want to do that stuff, but the system doesn't, particularly for the traditional roles, doesn't allow for right. it. Now, that doesn't say that you can't do it, especially with the internet and all these kinds of things and new technology and everything like that. Now you can find new avenues. For example, um, I know a guy, well, I don't know him very well, but I, I know a guy who knows a guy um, who studied medicine, did all that, became a doctor, became a surgeon, was doing all that. And then, um, this was years ago, this was about 15, maybe, yeah, about 15 years ago. And he recognized that there was a problem in surgeries where like surgeons just have to keep changing gloves, right? And that would contaminate, you know, if they contaminate something, that would contaminate the new pair of gloves and then, could, and then it was this whole problem. So he basically created these double-sided gloves, right? So you put the gloves on in a non-thorough place and as you go in, you can just strip off the layer and then, you know, not a crazy technological product. It's just two layers of latex, really. But that and now he, actually, he's created his own business through that, right? So that's just, and I mean, that's just a random anecdote. But like, there's loads of those types of opportunity. Maybe you study medicine and, you know, which is funny because a lot of actual, you know, a lot of doctors now, they don't all have, some are great. Some are less great in terms of their bedside manner and their, their sort of social skills and how they interact right. with people. And, you know, I, I'm not knocking any of that. Sometimes, you know, if you see why, especially if you, you know, spent your first 22 to 25 years of your life locked away studying, not really interacting, not socializing. And that's not, you know, plenty of people have bedside manner and have socialized outside of studying medicine, right. but, but it is a stereotype, right? And then some of them then don't necessarily have the best bedside manner, but you don't necessarily have to be that type of a doctor you can be you know you can study medicine and maybe be a content creator and deliver medical content to in in it like look at somebody like uh andrew Huberman, right and um, mm. i don't know if you know him he's a he's, yeah. a he's jumped up pretty big now in the last couple of years in popularity and he's a stanford based neuroscientist um really smart guy and you know he's not a practicing neuroscientist anymore he's not a physician he's not a, a, a sort of a, a a doctor so to speak in in, in that respect like a, a caregiver right in that percent anymore he's an educator so he goes deep into the weeds about all of the stuff that he's studied over his entire career and and continues to study and continues to find nuance and all these you know new ideas and he and that opens the door to other people who are studying to then come into his orbit and then he can share them, their experience, their profiles, their work, and then that gives them a boost then. And so, it's, you know, creating that ecosystem of expertise around various different, um, various different, and that's just mental, right? I'm just picking one of them there. But yeah, absolutely. Loads of stuff that you can do with. He's a great example of a aggregator of uh, neuroscientific content. And then he, he's very good at disseminating and explaining it in a easy to digest manner. So um, yeah, he's he's a great example of someone who's let's say uh, kept the existing uh, knowledge and uh, skill set, and then added some extra skill sets to 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 create a, a different type of career, I guess. Um, yeah, like I mean, in terms of the medicine, I, my brother in law is in the in, you know in the in the system in the healthcare system, and he absolutely loves it. So he's one example of someone who's really thriving there and doing extremely well. And then I also have a friend who's in the healthcare system and decided to. Uh, go to Australia because he just thought there was going to be uh, better, you know, better opportunities over there. So I've seen, I've seen both of them. Um, but the, I suppose the overarching point is that, you know, it's more than just, I'm interested in this subject and there's jobs available. So I'm going to go towards that. Um, 
you seem just to change sack a tiny bit you seem particularly interested in content overall obviously you know talking about andrew huberman and, and talking about gardener's world and then uh, writer's block is uh, very content based when you think about uh, platforms like twitter mon- or x let's call it x by its new name monetizing yeah. itself do you think that's going to be uh, a challenge to the journal- journalism industry or do you see more people moving towards that type of writing uh in 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 what so x uh, so x or formerly twitter is now yeah. paying people to be content creators by giving them small payments or larger payments based on the amount of uh, publications they do for these longer form type of articles so i suppose it's a question for me about whether or not people are actually going to be have a full-time twitter writing career mm. uh yeah i mean i don't see why not i mean look at substack look at medium they're kind of similar ideas, but with slightly different business models, right? Substack, you get paid based on the number of subscribers you have. Medium, you get a share once you hit a certain level of all the money collected based on the number of subscribers. Um, Twitter seems to be something closer to Substack. X seems to be closer to something like Substack there. Um, and it's interesting though. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, I personally have been, Big fan of Elon Musk. I think um, I think what he's doing with Twitter is actually pretty good. That's probably a controversial opinion these days. Um, but to me, like you know, we're we're living in a weird time, right? I I like Twitter in the sense that, like, okay, for sure, you might get a little bit more extreme content on there or see things that you don't like, but that's possibly good, right? Because the Overton window has shifted so far to the left these days that anything. Like, I would consider myself a centrist, right? But I can call right wing frequently. And it's it's not the case, right? And, uh, but it's just, be, and, and the, the, the weird thing about that is, it, you know, people are, there's such backlash depending on certain topic, right? Depending on what you're talking about. Um, that people are then afraid to talk about them and therefore afraid to write about them. And then that actually weirdly leads to a restriction of thought in your own mind. So if you can't write about something, you can't talk about something, you tend to self-censor in your own brain. So right. that's why I'm a big advocate for, for people to, you know, for example, to expose themselves to content that is that forces them to think that they don't like or they don't agree with because then you have to think about like, well, why did this person think that? How did they come to this conclusion? What forced them down this path rather than the path that I've come down? Right. You know, and it's typically based on experience. Um, it's actually, in fact, always based on experience. Um, so, so yeah, the content piece, right? And now, like we said earlier, like there's just so many more avenues, there's so much more content, so many more areas, just so many more options and variety across the board. The, the issue with that, it's the siloing and the sort of the um, echo chamber phenomenon still mm-hmm. exists. So that's why I kind of like Twitter for that regard. You know, if they're paying people for long form content, I'm a big proponent of long form content, first of all, because I did it again, wrong side. Um, so uh, it's this mirror thing. <laughs> um, I, I'm a big fan of the long form content purely because, you know, if you look at some of the, I mean, yeah, look at some of the clickbaity stuff out there now. You you can't get a good understanding. It's just there for for kick, like we said, to get millions of views, so that can satisfy advertisers, so that you can get revenue in the door. It's not really adding value, right? Yeah. So I think long form content adds value. So if people are paid to write long form content that adds value, I'm all for it. Yeah, and absolutely, and it's comprehensive, right? Hopefully, when they're writing a longer form piece, there's more details, there's examples, there's research, there's let's say, uh, presenting on both sides, even if it is uh, pitching one side more, at least it's presenting one side. So I'm totally yeah. with you. I, I think we need to be open to diverse opinions and opposing opinions. That is that is the foundation of our of, of our democracy as well, where we have an opposition and we have a government. And the opposition is always in opposition to the government. And that's a yeah. useful way to, to get to the best, well, ideally the best option, right? Not always, but ideally the best option. Um, well, then one of the things... A more that, informed option. Right. Right. You know, it might not be, I mean, that was one of the great things about the newspapers of the old days, right? Is like, you might have a columnist that you hate and you disagree with them. God, this guy or this girl comes out with some awful shite and I'm sick of hearing <laughs> it. But you read them every week. 
Yeah. Right. You expose yourself to them every week by reading their column and reading their thing. And going, oh, what are they going to say this time? And I'm so going to disagree with them again. Yeah. And that, like, I find that really, really healthy. Like, you know, yep. I grew up in a very argumentative household, right? You had to hold your own and, and you know, otherwise everybody gang up on you or, you know right. what I mean? Or, or But it makes your decision making more robust, right? It makes you more 100%. thoughtful and decisive and uh, clear of your own decisions because you've had to defend them more. You've had to support your own decision making. Um, I'm totally with you. When I'm speaking to people about like, especially sensitive topics, whether it be family or friends or, or clients, I always want to know, uh, can you present the opposite of what you what your uh, side is? Because once you can present the opposite argument, even if you disagree with it, well, now we know you've thought about this. You've thought it through. You've thought about it holistically, right? And often yeah. I find it's just like, no, but did you hear what my position was? That was what my position was. I'm like, no, nah, yeah. I get it. And so uh, so it's something I try to do for myself as well. Make sure, okay, can I argue or can I argue against myself to make sure I've got a robust uh, thought process here? Do you know Nick Friedman? He's a he another podcast. Big fan. Um, big fan, yeah. Big fan of Nick. Um, I'm probably showing my nerdy side here with like Andrew. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, he has a great thing, right? He always asks, hey, do you man the opposing case? Right. Meaning, you know, the straw man argument is to, to kind of, you know, make an exaggerated, totally exaggerated claim, you know, saying why it's ridiculous. Um, but to steel man it, like, why is it very robust? Why, why would this be a good idea? I and mean, if you force yourself to do that as an exercise, um, again, I think it's very, very healthy because you, you put yourself in somebody else's shoes or somebody else's perspective. And that gives you, you know, it gives you a different view because you have to think like well okay yeah why why did they think this what led them to this opinion um did they study this where did they grow up you know how did they how did they form these various different ideas that have led to this one central thing and then because yours is obviously different right so if you can it's like you know i don't know if you ever did any debating or anything like that right but you, at the top of the debate you're given a motion and you're either given for or against. Mm. And it, it's not up to you to decide whether you're for or against. You're just right. given for or against. And you have to argue what you've give, been given. Yeah. So, and again, very healthy, I think. So if you can do that in your own life, and you don't have to do it like, I would say, with any great rigor. But just to have that broadly in your head. Like if you're reading something, and especially if it's very one-sided, to think, hmm, well, I wonder what the other side of that is. What do, what do mm. other people say about that? And then you can make an informed decision. And then, because you might agree with something that's very, this is also the interesting point, right? You can maybe agree with something that's very, um, you know, one side, or you fall on that side, right? But then if you steal man the other side, you, you might actually become more secure in your um, belief on the, on the other side of that. What you originally, you might become more secure in what you originally thought, but you've explored the other side and you've mm -hmm. determined like, with reason and with, um, you know, with, with objectivity, no, okay, I've looked at this from X, Y, and Z, and actually I still disagree because of A, B, and C. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's, again, very healthy, actually. It's very healthy either way. It's very healthy either way. Do, do you think we're in a time where we're, we're forcing ourselves to choose sides more and more? Um, yeah. It's hard to say that. Definitely a couple of years ago, if you asked me, I would have said yes. I think a little bit of if not more slightly waning um, but everything has been massively politicized now and exploited right. um, what I do think is that we're living in the greatest age of propaganda that mm -hmm. probably ever been seen by humans um, like there's never been and this is the this is the this is the what would you call it the um, the fallacy or the the paradox of endless access to endless mm -hmm. information is right. is not not having access or not getting the information, it's actually being overflowed or flooded with information, inundated, that you then can't determine what's correct or what's real or what's right. That's a big problem. Um, so so that's, I think we're living in those times and I think that's gonna get a little bit worse before it gets better. But having said that, I think it will certainly get better because I think, I think COVID really woke people up a lot. Um, even myself, right? Like. For example, I've, I've lived abroad now. I've lived out of Ireland for nearly 10 years. 
And I used to read RT religiously just to keep up with what's going on. I used to check it every day, like what's going on in Ireland, what's happening and all this sort of stuff. And obviously that was the same for maybe the first half of, of the COVID period. But I would be reading things that were appearing uh, in RTE that were, let's say about France, right? I'm living in France and that were categorically full, like absolutely categorically wow. full. You know, they would say, France has announced they're going to go into lockdown tomorrow. I go, what? And then I go read, I go check the French papers and I, I check two or three for them. And then I, I was in French and then I would think, no, maybe I've misunderstood this. Maybe I've, let me go check the English version of the wow. same paper just to make sure. I've, and I'd read it and I go, no, no, they've actually announced the total opposite. Like, you know, Bruno Le Maire, whoever said, the last thing we're going to do is go into lockdown again. We, that's, that's literally the last thing we're going to do. We're trying all these other options. And then I go back to RT and say, no, France says they're going into lockdown tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. And that happened over and over and over and over again. I thought, you know what? I'm not reading this anymore because it, it's categorically full. Like, and then, you know. What do you think is going on there? Is that, is that sloppy journalism? Is it bad translation? Or is it just somebody under time pressure to get 10 articles out an hour? I think it's a little bit more complex than that. I think, I think, I don't know. I'm going to sound very conspiratorial here. RT in particular, right? Just this organization, forget about anything else, but that's the highly linked and tied to the government, right? The national broadcaster, they have an agenda to push. The government had an agenda to push during COVID. They wanted to get, like Ireland, for example, was in the longest level five lockdown of anybody in Europe. Like if it was over 350 days or something like that, of level five lockdown. No, no other country came close to that in Europe, right? And, you know, and there's a whole other range of factors that, that fall into that, right? But the government had their own agenda on a number of different points. And you use the biggest and best tool you have at your disposal to disperse that agenda, the national broadcaster. Right. So you've, you've big question marks over the, uh, the, the rationale and the logic behind those publications you think was done. Um, yeah. I think there was a lot of fear mongering. Right. I think I think there was a lot of fear mongering. Um, why? That's very subjective. Uh, so I won't go into that because that'll definitely make me sound like a conspiracy. <laughs> um, but um, but I do think there was a lot of fear mongering for a var- variety of reasons. And I think um, you know, and and uh, like one of the reasons would have been just purely, especially at the beginning, like we just didn't know, right? We didn't yeah. know what the hell was going on. And I think you know that fear mongering has spread across so many different aspects now i was just taking COVID as one example but there's, there's so many different things now and as i said we're living in an age of extreme propaganda and also hysteria like i think we're living in an age of hysteria here as well so the more people that can sort of pause think for themselves steel man opposing views expose themselves to things you know content videos articles book whatever that force you to think about something from a completely different way or give you a new perspective that you'd never seen before and never thought about before. I think the more people that do that, the healthier society will be broadly. And that sort of, you know, that hysteria will die down. That echo chamber phenomenon will be reduced. Um, but that's hard, right? Like that's really hard to do. It's super difficult. Are these principles that you're trying to convey to your journalists in writer's block to to be able to steal man their arguments, to be able to cut through propaganda back up there writing with research or like when you when you talk about training, what does that what does that involve exactly? Yeah, so training falls into two categories. There'd be one for actual the journey and like the storytelling. Um, and again, because we focus on kind of premium features. Yeah. like you have to be able to you know people's attention span are it's not that they're shorter but there's just such a variety of other like engaging highly engaging content that if you're writing a story your storytelling needs to be phenomenal right so first and foremost basic you know have your references have your interviews have your plan though you know that's uh, the objective stuff and the hard stuff the, the more intangible stuff would be things like the, the art of storytelling, um, including, you know, a human element, um, what resonates with people, what do people actually care about? Um, you know, and that varies again from, from publication to publication, right? If you're reading something, you know, 
that's more, I guess, scientific or that's more sort of uh, objective. Maybe you might be, you, you might be, you might be reading that for the facts and for the numbers and for the, you know, but if you're reading something that's closer to arts and culture or close, you know, you might be more interested in the, the human interest piece, right? But having said that, the human interest piece in any story is actually the, the most resonant bit because people can then make themselves in that person's shoes, right? So, for example, um, you know, because again, people like our brain aren't wired to understand numbers to a great degree. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as people start to bit out facts and statistics and, and, you know, all sorts of data, I mean, most people, and not all, but most people will kind of glaze over. So it's, it's that, it's that inclusion of a, a persona and typically a real person as well, that this is what resonates most because people go, Jesus, imagine that was me. Or imagine I was in that situation as you're reading it. And I think that's what, what really resonates. Yeah, so the, the storytelling aspect is um, much more engaging, right, than just a list of facts and figures typically. Um, so would you say your your, your day is involved, Your day is made up of working on the products, uh, working with uh, clients, trying to make sales, or trying to, uh, you know, and trying to train journalists? Or, or how would you kind of categorize the, the top three or four things that you do? Yeah, I am top three or four things that I do. Well, this would be for both um, businesses. So outreach is like the single most important thing you can do. That's, you know, varied. It'll be social media posts, send that email, um, having calls with people, all that sort of stuff. Um, just trying to make people aware of what we're doing, both for Writer's Block and RightPay. Um, for Writer's Block specifically, then what we do is we work one-to-one -one with all of our journalists as well. So, um, for example, right, a journalist will send us a couple of pitches. We will distribute them across our network of, of publishers and try and get commissions for each of them, right, so that they don't have to, to do the legwork there. Um, and what we'll do is then have feedback sessions on that. We'll say, like, look, you didn't get commissions over here because they said they weren't interested in this story for whatever reason. And or you got a commission over here and this is what they want you to do with it and whatever else. And then we brainstorm with them some ideas. They'll say, look, I have an idea about this, this, and this. And we say, okay, we help them tease out that. And we provide them with ideas as well. We say, look, these publications are looking for stories about X, Y, and Z. What do you think of that? How do you, you know? So they're the kind of one-to-one -one sessions that we do with the journalists. And then we do that a little bit with the publications as well, although they're a little bit harder to get one-to-one -one right. because, you know, they're busy and they can go away. I know how to run the business. I mean, okay. That's very, that's very cool though, that you're the business brain of the journalists or you're like coaching and mentoring them about how to improve their, their sales pitch and helping them get more articles and... Um, help well, help them learn more deals. deals. Do you know what I mean? Right. Their 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 skill set is in the writing, right? And and mine is in sales and marketing and and finance, right? So it it kind of makes sense for us because well, also as, as you and it the the sort of journalism and and writing um, side of our business, he knows like what is going like what makes a good pitch and what makes a good story as well. On top of that, like and how much editing is going to be required to go into, you know, because sometimes you'll get a, a finished product back from a journalist and it will require quite a bit of editing before we right. send it out to, um, uh, to, a, to a publisher. And it's not like things like, you know, not changing the story, but just to make it like, like I said, more engaging, adding a human element to it, you know, just don't number dump onto the page, you know, all these kind of little things. And then well, from the freelance side of things, my skills would be, yeah, just like trying to, trying to grow the business element of that, which they're not. Um, massively keen to to try and do themselves because it's a lot of work to try and like learn a whole set of extra skills. Right. Right. Well, what do you think is the biggest challenge they have in terms of pitching and selling their work? Is it um, the mechanics of how to put together the pitch, or is it the idea of selling themselves? Which I know from speaking to a lot of clients, is they find that kind of awkward or difficult or hard to do. They'll say, "I'll sell you much more than I'll sell me," um, or is it you know something else? No, that's, that you nailed it there. Um, so yeah, what, one is definitely like selling themselves, like you say, um, a lot of them are uncomfortable and a lot of people see sales as a kind of a slimy, you know, mm -hmm. don't want to do that, you know, and, and, and I can understand where that stereotype has come from, right? Uh, for sure. But one thing that people sort of, um, fail to recognize is that like, especially now, like good. Like if you're selling something that adds value to 
whatever somebody else does, right? And that can be for a product or in our case, if you're selling an article, like the article adds value to the publication. If it's a well-written article and it's tailored to their audience, and you have, that's the other thing as well. Like they, they don't have a full understanding always of what the publications are looking for, right? Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of generic pitches and we have to say like, the, the in-house team could have written that themselves, right? So you've got to go a step beyond. Don't, you know, um, and one guy um, recently pitched about, he's a, he's a sports journalist, rugby journalist, and he pitched a story about, you know, Fabien Gauthier, Six Nations team in France. And I was like, they're, you know, anybody can write that. Like the Irish Times could write that, Telegraph, the guard, anybody could write that in the sport. That pick something that's more nuanced, more niche, that's interesting. Why, you know, look at maybe, you know, the technology or something like that that's been adapted mm. by all these rugby teams. So you want a u very unique angle um, coming at Absolutely the story. Unique, at, not me, the publication. That's what yeah. they want. They want this unique stuff that's not appearing. in Because if you look at the funnel, right, top of the funnel, you've got um, Associated Pred, Reuters, Globe, Newswire, and, and a few of these other, they're the top big three, right? And loads of companies, loads of publications will have deals with them where they just, where they can just get whatever story comes out of Reuters and then that goes into the paper and away you go. Now, the problem with that is loads of these publications want exclusivity, but then with that model, you're having the same story. And I mean, identically, word for word, the same story appearing in, and the Irish Times and the Independent do this as well, and a few other papers in Ireland as well. Like everybody does this to some degree for all the top of the funnel, but they're all identical. So you've no distinction or differentiation at all um, from those other papers that are writing the same story. So the neat, unique element is huge for us because that's what publications want. They want, and again, we actually try and advocate for, you know, journalist has almost become a dirty word as well. Like we want writers who are, what's called writer's block writer's block and not journalist block, right? Because we want people who are very knowledgeable in their field and interested in sharing their expertise. Um, you know, in, in, in a similar way that maybe somebody like Andrew Huberman does or, or, you know, there's loads of different examples, but basically if you have spent a career studying something and been involved in something and you've connections to a community that most people don't have, and you know how to get certain information that's hard to get that other people can't get. And then you have insights and perspectives and, and, you know, and like, um, Delaney says, you know, like with his, with his know your value, like if you've done all these courses and all these different things, that's stuff that most people haven't done. So lean into that, do that. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's actually a big thing that people fail to recognize. They think that, oh no, I should just write about what's popular. What did I see in all the other headlines there in the last week? Oh, I'll mm -hmm. just write about that. And that's one of the things that we have to try and shift mindset about. It's like, no, 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 no. What are you really, what are you really knowledgeable in? Or where are you really highly connected? Because other things as well, like one side, we do focus on areas of expertise, but also we focus on regional knowledge as well. Like if you're at Perfect example, right? We've got journalists covering the African Cup of Nation and the Asian uh, Cup, right? Which are both kicking off in, they pick, actually kick off next week, this, uh, this January, right? So if you're a publication, right? Let's say you, you have a sports publication, you know, and you want to cover both of those events, but you don't have somebody on the ground, you know, that's very difficult to know, like, and, and they're kind of easy examples, like, because they're big events, but um, even somewhere like Gaza or the Ukraine, right? If you want to send somebody there to cover stories that are that are happening there and coming out of there, it's very difficult for you to, but, well, first of all, if you send somebody from your own team, it can be very costly. Uh, it can be very dangerous. And there's a whole other set of risks there. Say you don't do that and you want to find somebody who's already there. It can be very difficult to find the right person um, and find a knowledgeable person and find all the right connection, et cetera, et cetera. And also at the same time, deliver that standard of quality in the writing and in all the other stuff that you need and that you want. Um, so we basically provide all of that, right? Like we say like, okay, we've got these people who live in Gaza or live in the Ukraine or are traveling already to the African Cup of Nations or traveling already to the, to the Asian games or whatever it might be. And you can 
minimize your cost and still get those feature stories. You just connect with us and then we'll distribute the, the story that comes from the journalist to you and, and the way you go. So it, it removes the risk, it removes the cost, it removes the hassle. And it also then, you know, you're getting unique content that doesn't necessarily appear in Reuters or Apes. Yeah, that's a great way of explaining it. I can totally see how that's like a compelling uh, pitch for them, right? So taking away the cost and then delivering the unique content. And you've done all the the filtering to make sure, you know, everything's on the money and, it, you know, it looks good and it stands out. And it's a little bit different from the, the sort of mainstream stuff. Would you have any uh, tips or advice for someone who's looking to to write that sort of content or for someone who's looking to get into journalism? Because as you said, journalism can be see- like if you said to your parents, those two people who you say, uh, help me with my college course, I'm going to do journalism. They might say, <gasps> Don't, yeah. uh, because they have the idea that maybe the, the careers aren't there anymore. Would you have any advice for someone who's thinking about being a writer or a journalist? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't like giving advice, right? Because there's so much variety out there. But what I would say is perhaps maybe reconsider doing a bachelor's in journalism. I probably wouldn't do that if I had the choice. I mean, I didn't, but um, I, I, I wouldn't choose that. I would consider doing some studying something technical like if you're 17 or 18 right now study something technical right mm-hmm. business courses you know a four-year business course you can do a master's and you can do an mba in one year same thing but in one year rather than four, right uh same thing with journalism like you can do a three or four year journalism course but if you do a master's in journalism you'll get all that one year anyway mm-hmm. so i would personally think it's probably a better option to um, you know, study something technical, whether it's in the field of science or engineering or whatever it might be technical. It can be sports or psychology or whatever, right? Um, and then you can do the generic stuff later, right? Um, and, you know, if you really want, unless, unless, you know, you want to be an accountant or something like that, then you can study business and then you, and then you can write about accounting later and whatever else. But I would, I would consider everybody to start writing you know, because it, um, we need more opinions and we need more diverse opinions and we need more people challenging the status quo and we need more people who are knowledgeable in a massive variety of fields. So I would suggest study some technical and then do a master's in journalism. Yep. Yep. They're, they're good tips. Um, I think there, there, there's one or two writers that I follow, Ryan Holiday and Robert Green, and one of the things they always tell you know these uh, these writers obviously they found them both actually both of them. And one of the the tips they said was, uh, and I think that's kind of what you're you're talking about as well in terms of study something technical is one of the best forms of writing is having something to say. And if you study something technical, you've got something to say, right? Because you're in the details of it, you understand the nuance, you're following the latest research. Um, but would you also like when people come to you and they're like looking for a writing gig, would you read a portfolio or would you look for them to have a certain portfolio of 10 pieces or 20 pieces or, or, you know, how do you decide whether or not you take someone on for a gig or not? Oh, it kind of depends. Yeah. For, well, we look at a number of things, right? Cause we got to vet the journalist before we sort of um, distribute anything that they do or any of their work out to, um, the, the publications. Right. So what we'll do is, uh, we'll look at their previous body of work. Now, some of our journalists are quite green, right? In the sense that either A, they've just graduated. And so they don't have a huge body of work. It's mostly like, you know, student paper stuff or whatever. Um, or maybe that they are brand new to journalism altogether or brand new to writing. Maybe they were a writer in another capacity. We have a few content writers who have now moved over. They don't like doing the branding stuff anymore. They want to do more sort of in-depth, more journalistic type of thing. So what we'll do is look at their body of work broadly, no matter who you are, and no matter how big that is, right? Because that is a good indication. Um, and then we'll, the first suggestion is just, just write more, send us your pitches. And then we will, we, we can evaluate reasonably well from somebody's pitch what their level is. Right. And then, and then it adds to that then of like, well, what's their background then on top? So first of all, first and foremost is like ability to write. Um, and you know, because that will give us an idea of how much we have to uh, work with them. And then second of all, it's like their experience and their, their background. Like if you want to talk about, you know, in depth about like financial engineering and, and all sorts of different complex quantitative models and all the kind of, you, you, 
if you don't have a background in that, in finance or in mathematics or in physics, it's not credible, right? right. It, or unless, unless you're self-taught, um, but, but it comes across very quickly whether or not somebody is knowledgeable in the subject or not. There's a great book by a fellow called Alan Sokal. It's called Fashionable Nonsense, right? And it's all about um, people. Yeah, it's really good. Um, it's all about people writing scientific papers that get published in academic journals even, but it's nonsense. They just use lots of buzzwords. They use lots of uh, jargon. They use lots of terms that people find sexy, um, but it's crap, total crap. So, um, oh, that's kind of so scary. we try and avoid that kind of thing, right? You know, if you want to write about something that's really in depth or you, you say that you have, um, you know, perspective or expertise, and insight, or... Um, yeah, back it up. You have to back it up. And that's, that's kind of when you say, uh, send, when you say, you uh, ask people to send a pitch, a sales pitch, is that, sorry, is that a sales pitch or is that an article? Like a sales pitch saying, this article, is why I'm great article pitch. or an, art, an article. Okay. So here's an article that you, no, no. that I think would be good. And then maybe it's a CV or their portfolio backing that up as well. So you can make a article pitch, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you've never worked with somebody before included in the pitch, you'll have to add a line or two of your bio. Like, why are you a good person? Not only a good, the best person to write this story. So first you want to be a pitch about the story, right? What's the narrative? What's the trajectory of the story? Why is it important for that publication? Why should they care? Like the readers as well as the editor, you know, why, why is it relevant for them? And why is it interesting? Um, and then on top of that, then if they've never worked with you before, or we've never worked with them before, why are they the best person to write this story? Um, what gives you the credence to, to give a better overview or a better. And that's like a great outline of the article already, right? If they just took that as an outline and wrote an article around that, that's actually a really good start. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the funny thing. This is why, um, uh, and this is really interesting, right? Lots of in-house staffers who have left major publications or have left big newspapers and magazines, they never really had to do that, right? A lot of them, be, like you're, you're put on a desk, you're given a brief, you're told to do this, you're, I mean, your parameters and everything are laid out in front of you. So you just effectively have to write and that's it. Whereas as a freelancer, you really have to fight to get your foot in the door and to, to, to convince people that no, 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 pick me for this story because of all these reasons. And this yeah. is why it's going to be good for your paper as well. And and that's what we try and that's a, that's a really, really, that's probably the number one skill is being able to, to sell both yourself and the story. Like, yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great point and, and a really, really important piece of advice. It's something I spend a huge amount of my time doing is trying to help people sell themselves well. And, and like you said, a lot of people don't feel very warm and fuzzy when they think about sales. But the way uh, I think about it or I try to, you know, uh, share with them is I think it's really about protecting, uh, protecting the relationship. Uh, so you're not saying like the, the image people have sometimes is I'm trying to take or I'm trying to trick the other person. But really, it's about helping and protecting, helping them in terms of helping them make the best decision possible by providing them with all the information and then uh, protecting the relationship. But in terms of if it's not the right fit, then we say, you know, I've provided all the information. Uh, I've provided my pitch. And actually, based on what you've said, I'm actually not sure either. So maybe we shouldn't go through with this. And so you protect it as well. And what happens in that moment is they kind of go, I actually, tr you're not right for this particular job or role. I actually trust you more though. And I'm going to call you for the next one. Or I'm going to refer you to somebody because I know you're not just trying to uh, pull the wool over my eyes. So I try to uh, help people get into that mindset because on the other hand, if we don't do that, if someone doesn't pitch or sell themselves well, then you have this situation where we haven't allowed the professional hire, the, the newspaper or the article, uh, you know, hire. We haven't allowed them make a good decision for themselves. And I think that's unfair on them. So I'm just like, I'm trying to say, let's be fair to them and help them, allow them to make the best decision. And if it's not you, it's not you. But if it is you, give them that chance. <laughs> you know? yeah, so my well, you said it. The, the one word I picked out there was relationship, right? And there's, if you have a long-term, um, sort of long-term thinking mindset, then, then that will come to the fore. And like you said, you won't get, this is, this is another thing that, that happens to a lot of people who maybe haven't done sales before, um, is that like rejection part of it, right? Somebody like most, actually most people will tell you no, and, and that's fine. And it's, it dealing with that no, then is, is where, is where people tend to fall down, um, and like you say, if you can, 
you know, people trust you a lot more if you say, oh, actually, do you know what? Maybe I'm not the best person for this, but I tell you what, this girl over here is, or this guy over here is, or whatever. That does instill trust a lot more because people know that you're not just, you're not just chasing the sale for the sake of the sale. Right. You're, you're trying to help that person. And that's, you know, um, I think, mate, was it? I can't remember who said it, but anyway, it was something along the lines of, you know, the difference between like, you know, manipulation is usually where it has a negative outcome, right? right. You, if you're, you know, and coercion and that sort of stuff. Whereas if you're trying to influence somebody, um, if you're adding value and you're helping them and they're happy with that and they find it positive and then they can grow and develop on the back of what you provided, whatever that might be, that's not manipulation, that's help. You're adding value. You're creating and being productive and helping that other person be productive. Um, I think that's what gets lost again a little bit in this sort of, um, you know, the, the the word fail, right? Exactly, exactly. And and uh, and the other person needs the help, or they need the service, or they need the product that you're offering. So you're you're helping to fulfill a need that they have, right? It's the same as if you go to buy a new phone and they're telling you about it like you have a need for a new phone and they're just helping you figure out so i i think on the rejection thing like the question is is it a rejection of you as a person or is it a rejection of the the fit and the article or the the product for that moment in time and, and when people make that separation i think it, it helps put them on a on a good path you know so is it a rejection of you or is it a rejection of that specific fit for that moment it's often never a rejection of you it's very very rarely a rejection of you as a person right and there's a there's a one of the best videos on the internet um is, is a fellow called jia zhang he's a chinese guy moved to america i don't know if you ever heard of him he's done this thing called rejection therapy right? <laughs> i have seen this have you seen it yeah it's amazing right it's, it's fantastic i love it this guy phenomenal right for anyone who doesn't know or who's not aware um, this guy was a very shy, timid guy, he moved to America, thought he was going to, you know, build the next Microsoft to do the world, didn't, and then was like, oh my God, I'm so deflated. Um, So, and like all of this rejection that had happened to him had sort of crippled him socially in a certain way. So what he did was, was go out and do a hundred days of every day getting rejected in different ways, right? So one of the, I think the first thing he did was he go out some randomer for a hundred dollars. Right. And, and, you know, at the start, he even says he does a TED talk, I think, on it as well. And he does a Google talk and a few others where he goes into the details of the background of it. Right. Um, but the one thing he says is like people, people often don't even say no. Right. He asked the guy for a hundred dollars. The guy didn't say no. He goes, Oh, well, why do you need a hundred dollars? Right. You know, and then, but your man was so flooded. He was like, Oh, he was expecting no. And then he goes, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then he ran away. And it was only later when he was watching himself because he videoed all of these. Right. So he, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. watching his own video back and he goes, the guy didn't even say no. He actually asked why. So oftentimes, the lesson I took from that is exactly as you say, it's not a rejection of you. Oftentimes it's not no. It's more like not now or I don't have enough information or, you know, it's not convenient for our thing, but maybe in a different context, it might be more convenient or whatever else, right? Or loads of stuff. If, particularly if we look at uh, writer's block in particular, like if you send a pitch and it gets rejected, there's a million reasons why it might get rejected aside from the actual story. Budget constraint. The editor's having a bad day. Literally, like that can be as simple as that. And they're just like, I'm not dealing with it today. You know, and yeah. no, goodbye. And then you might have to just come back the next day and say, oh, hey, listen, um, you know. So I think if people can sort of recognize that, um, that's huge, right? Go out and get rejected. And that's the great thing about doing sales, right? I, I've, had several sales roles over the years. One of them was even, I used to work for a fuel company and I had to ring up customers who would say, right. I'll never buy from you again and right. get them to buy again. And so, and you, you know, you how and you could come tell How'd you do it? With great difficulty. But people, like most, 90% of the people I spoke to would say no, right? So that actually does build up a thick skin. And at the start, of course, first couple of calls, you sort of think to yourself, Oh God, am I, you know, is this me or like, no, 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 no. Like there's been a bridge burnt somewhere. These people have a perspective and it, I'm just the fate in this now. It's nothing to do with me. It's just, they've had a bad experience somewhere along the line. So, uh, so for me, it's not, I'm not trying to sell them something. I'm actually just trying to ask a bunch of questions that'll figure out like, well, how do we get to this point and how do we move forward? Um, 
and and that's really like that's what the best sales really uh, really is. Um, it's interesting if you and if you link and if you link it back to if you link it back to the guy who's doing the rejection therapy, the guy didn't actually say no. So if he stayed there a little bit longer and said like, well, because he was saying, well, what you need it for? He was kind of like open to it, and I think that oh, can happen. Like, yeah, that can happen a lot in uh, business deals or you know job pitches or sales pitches or anything like that. And it's just kind of staying a little bit longer and saying, that's okay, but can you tell me like what's what's uh, what's not working for you in this situation? And give them a chance to say, oh, it's actually A or B or C, and then you can actually deal with it. But equally, again, if it's not there, some people listening will still think, oh, you're still trying to you're still trying to force me. It's like, no, no, no. You're still trying to hold me, yeah. But still, if it's not, but then if they say, oh, because that is like, okay, well, that's that's a. Yeah, I, I can see it from your perspective now. That's cool. Okay, so we're not doing business. That's fine. But if it's that other thing that we can resolve, let's resolve that. Yeah. And oftentimes, I mean, you probably even think about it yourself, right? If if you're thinking about buying something, rarely do you buy immediately on the spot. Like you, you reflect on it, you consider it, you look at other options, and then you come back to the person that you felt was most, um, you, you sort of, you, you actually, that you like, right? That's the thing. My mum used to always say to me, you'll catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, right? And uh, people buy things from people they like more often than not, right? So if you are considerate and you're polite and you ask questions and you are there to help people, and I don't mean just acting like this. I mean, you've got to be genuinely there wanting to help somebody. But if you do that and you embody that and you portray that, people recognize it, they pick it up and they trust you and they like you and they'll, They'll buy from you. And it's the same thing with anything. Whether you're selling a product or a service as part of a business, whether you're trying to convince somebody to go to a restaurant, whether you're trying to convince somebody to to do one activity over another, like everything is failed. Like everything is persuasion. So if you um, get stuck in this loop of, you know, you just accept when people say no, and then you you kind of, you, you embody that as part of your personality, like you're going to end up very bad and and troubled like in, in the sense that you know you're not going to feel a whole lot of self work but really you're myth categorizing all of that like none of that is actually attributed to you uh, mm-hmm. so it's up to you then to sort of you know get out of that loop and you know one of the best ways to do that is to just to ask questions right and um, and really kind of get to the heart of why somebody it said no in the birth get to the heart of it and give them a chance to, to see if it is a good fit do you have any like uh, when when I um, when I play tennis uh, or when I'm speaking to people about uh, uh, sales pitches and stuff like that? I find there's a there's a correlation, there's a similarity in both of them, and that is mm. sometimes we hit the net, which is like we're we're defeating ourselves, and sometimes when mm. we don't pitch, we're defeating ourselves. So it's not actually we're 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 forcing our own errors as opposed to just say get the ball over the net or make the pitch and then let them decide or let them come back. So do you have any? advice on you know trying to encourage people you know just don't do it yourself let them to do it um yeah well honestly ask questions first and keep trying like persevere um that i think i don't know i think that even message is, is a little bit lost these days people kind of try something one thing i'm well that's not working didn't work <laughs> yeah done that <laughs> do it again then <laughs> yeah. you know Wait, I, I remember a phrase when I was growing up. It was try, try, try again. And if that doesn't work, try some more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know. I think that's really helpful because, you know, there's a million ways to, as my dad used to say, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And uh, you can, you know, the different approaches. We're such a diverse world now and people have so many diverse interests and motivations and perspectives and insights. So, you know, you're not necessarily, like you say, you're not necessarily going to get an eight every time you hit it. You might hit the net. You might hit it too long. Um, whatever else. So the trick is to just keep playing, right? And keep asking questions. And um, and and to that, not like, you know, and genuine questions as well. Not Again, not just for the sake of it, but that'll get the heart. And people, you know, people love to tell you what what's happening or what's going wrong in their business or why they need particular help. Um and again, if you can listen to that, like genuinely listen, then you'll be able to help them then on the back end. Yep. That sounds like uh, so sounds like great advice. Do you think to just to just to wrap up, do you think that kind of connects with how you got started by networking and getting into right pay and writer's block by asking questions, meeting people? Was that the main go to go to market strategy or was there other 
tools that you use to create those two opportunities for yourself? Um, yeah, I get what I mean. I have a lot of, I have got a lot of questions anywhere, everywhere I go, right? Even in school, and I, I get told to shut up all the time. Uh, and, and sometimes with good reason. Um, but yeah, no, just putting yourself out there. Um, you know, I, it might not come across, but I, I'm quite shy internally, right? I've been quite, you know, I have, like anybody, you know, you have these insecurities, but I, I, maybe I'm lucky in that I was able to recognize that, like the way to get over that is to actually go to the extreme other end and, you know, force yourself into, you know, um, situations where you might be uncomfortable, right? Because the more, and I don't mean like, you know, any degree of crazy discomfort, but if you're a little bit uncomfortable, it doesn't matter what the situation is, right? But just putting yourself in new situations, then all of a sudden you start to, you have a much greater surface area with which you're then comfortable because you have then a little bit of experience to draw from. Whereas if you do the opposite and you're just trying to seek comfort the whole time, and oh, I'm only going to do this, then actually you start to over time rule out all these different things. You go, no, don't like that, don't like that, not having that, not having that. And that breaks the surface area with which you're comfortable and, and uh, comfortably able to operate. Um, so, and, and over time, then that shrinks to zero. And then you're just completely insecure and uncomfortable all the time. So if you can just put yourself out there, like you're, you're your own worst enemy, right? Like um, somebody else, I think a few people have said this, right? But it's... It, it, a good example is people posting on social media for their bid, right? You get very, you know, especially if you haven't posted before, you get very self-conscious of what are people going to think? What are they going to say? What if they don't get any likes? Oh my God. Like what if there's going to be comments? No, I mean, they probably won't to start off with. Um, but you've got to do it anyway. And the first thing is the hardest. Mm -hmm. Second one gets easier and so on and so forth. So put yourself out there. Um, and the same thing, like, you know, I know people who used to hate cold calling. I hate it mm -hmm. still, but not for the same reason, right? Um, because, you know, 80 to 90% of the calls, you're going to get told no or to go away or, or whatever. Um, but it, if you if you build up a practice of doing like, you know, maybe two, three, four hours of cold calling every day, uh, you'll you'll quickly become very comfortable with, with hearing no. And, you know, you don't necessarily take it to heart and go, okay, well, they didn't want the on the next, yeah. you know. You might even start to enjoy the uh, cold calling process, right? You might even start to build up a, a few relationships. Uh, I mean, uh, going over to you and speaking to you at a conference out of nowhere was was a reason that we got uh, connected. So, uh, you know, I definitely feel like approaching people and starting conversations is a great way uh, to kick off uh, a, a relationship and get to know more people. John, it's been fascinating speaking to you as I knew it would be. Uh, about everything from putting yourself out there to preparing a sales pitch to the to journalism to how you got started by networking your way and selling your way into to startups and showing that your talking career shit. can talking shit. Can, <laughs> that's your final sales pitch of the uh, of the podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, talking of shit, so people you, will start to great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's super. We'll coach you on that later. Okay. Uh, but uh, but you're wonderful for taking the time to speak to us today and uh, thanks so much for sharing all your tips and insights really appreciate it oh no well thank you Ronan thanks for having me and uh, you're doing a great service for, for a lot of people so um, yeah I appreciate being on here and I appreciate what you're doing thank you just before one last thing I almost forgot uh, would you like to do a shout out for the two uh, links or where people would find you or where they'd find out, find out more about your uh, websites Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, well, writersblock.eu is uh, writersblock, very easy. Um, if you Google writersblock, hopefully if we've done our SEO right, you'll, you'll, it'll come up pretty high there. Yep. Um, but writersblock.eu or writepay.co, spelled R-I-T-E-P-A-Y. Right, spelled the wrong way. So R-I-T-E-P-A-Y.co. And, and writersblock, uh, block is spelled B-L-O-C, right? Oh, all three, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Right. A bit of a play on words, they if you were doing, they were doing there. Well done, very, very, very solid. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a question for you, Ronan. Before we go, um, I'm interested yep. to know what's the best and worst thing about your job. What's your favorite bit, and what's the bit you hate most? Uh, my favorite thing about what I do is helping people see the value that they have in themselves. Because I find once they see um, how their skills, their abilities, all their responsibilities and all their experiences, both good and bad, have added up to create 
let's call this career capital, which is this asset that they can take with them throughout their career. Um, it builds their confidence. It helps them see what they've got to offer. And it helps, it basically unlocks all the other uh, doors that they need. So this is the big pillar that I love to help people knock over, opens all those doors. And then after that, they can go out and find lots of opportunities. And I, I hope it's a strategy they can use continuously throughout their career and not just a kind of once off, uh, not just a kind of once off thing. So that, 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 that really is something that I find super enjoyable. And also one of the reasons I got into this is, is not just to help people with their careers, but to help them with their careers in a way that they could use the same strategies and the same techniques in other areas of their life. The career is just a super practical way of you know, getting in there and starting with that because it's like, hey, I need a job. Okay, let's get you a new job. Uh, whereas if it's, oh, I want to change, improve something about my life in general, uh, I found that was very broad. So I said, let's go niche and really help them uh, with that one particular area. So uh, yeah, so so that, that'd be one thing that I really, really enjoy about what I do. And the thing that um, I really, really struggle with, I think is using uh, all these technology platforms, right? Because they're, you're endlessly tweaking them. You're endlessly adding logos or changing colors or changing fonts. So it's something I'm trying to move away from a little bit more. I, anything like that, that's kind of administrative, um, it kind of is a is a struggle for me for sure, um, and I, I, but also I never try to pretend that like I work for myself and everything is just joyous all the time. It's there's definitely lots of challenges. It's a I hard have, graph, but I try to. It's a hard graph. It's a hard graph, but I try to enjoy the graph. I try to embrace the struggle, um, and and uh, make it as enjoyable as possible. Do you have anyone in the background who helps you with the admin or helps you with your your stuff, or is it all you? <laughs> So, uh, so the last, uh, seven years I've been like 99.9% doing it all myself. And then in the last, uh, two or three months, I've started to uh, take on, uh, three freelancers to help me with some, uh, video work, some project management, uh, and then some, uh, marketing as well. So trying to, uh, build that out as well to, to help me, uh, grow and, uh, impact more people and, uh, bring, bring more value. So that's the. That's the future. And then I've expanded. Uh, so going from individual sessions to an online community where I'll be doing group workshops uh, and streaming live on, on LinkedIn. Um, so doing these group workshops so people can join, they can get all the information. Um, and if that's all they need, that's fine. But if they want to do you know, uh, the group workshops live with me or individual sessions, then they can do that as well. So very exciting, very exciting time. Uh, Brilliant. Well, congrats uh, in, in and, business. and hiring people and everything and not you know, you're adding value to both their lives and then also to your whole operation as well. So big congrats and best luck with the, uh, with the, with the year. That is the plan. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And, uh, well done on the, the two startups. Look forward to seeing how you progress. Maybe we'll, we'll do this again in, in a year or a year and a half and see how you're getting on. Circle back. Yeah. Yeah. Here. I'll either be, yeah, I'll be, I'll be doing really well or be home. But you never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much again, John. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it.